On my honor, I will never betray my badge, my integrity, my character, or the public trust. I will always have the courage to hold myself in my actions. I will always uphold the Constitution, the community, and the agency I serve. Welcome to episode number 23 of the On the Blue Line podcast called Monday Morning Roll Call. I am your host and the founder of On the Blue Line, Wayne Mulder. This week, I just want to give you a real quick reminder, and that's on our Patreon account. As an added thank you for the first 14 days, any new Patreon supporters will get an On the Blue Line decal. And just as a special thank you for your support, and that's at any membership tier. So it includes our basic $4 a month level. So I appreciate your consideration for that. That does it for this week's announcements. The Monday Morning Roll Call starts now. So this week, I wanted to jump right into finishing answering a question that I started last week. Again, these questions, they come from our closed Facebook group on the Blue Line Guild. So be sure to follow the show notes and join us in there. The question that was posed involved my opinion on certain gun rights and restrictions from a law enforcement perspective and what the internal climate at the agency was in reference to this subject. I started last week by laying out some groundwork for this answer. First, these are major questions. Again, because of the recent tragedy, mass casualty events that have taken place. But the point that I wanted to make was that we first have to separate the firearm restriction conversation from the more important and applicable question, which is how do we deal with these events? Because as I discussed last week, not all mass casualty events involve firearms. So if we're truly looking for causation, we have to look to actual commonalities, not political agendas. But secondly, I also argued that if discussions or decisions are to be discussed in any climate, including in legislation, it should not be when emotions are at all-time highs. In fact, that's usually when good decisions cannot be made. So if you did not listen to last week's Monday Morning Roll Call, episode 22, I encourage you to go back, listen to that first, and then come back to this one. So with those two considerations in mind, let me repeat the question that was posed to me. It came out, it said, here's a question a lot of us would like to know. What is your position on gun control, both in general and as it applies to black rifles or what is termed assault rifles or MSRs, modern sporting rifles? How does this apply to handguns as well? Is an armed citizenry a deterrent to criminals? What do you think? What about your fellow officers? What about command? Is there command pressure to avoid this discussion? And are the politics too invasive for cogent thought? I hope you'll take on this. It should be interesting. So let me break this down a little bit to provide thoughts on each question as they were posed. I'm going to take these a little out of order so that I can better answer them. So let me start with that final question. Are the politics too invasive to allow for cogent thought? Reasoned? rational, coherent, lucid thought? Yes, but it doesn't have to be. That is why I went ahead and dealt with these questions on these podcasts. See, because it is imperative that we're able to encounter difficult and differing matters of opinion with coherent and reasonable thought. Basically the opposite of what you're seeing in a lot of media this week and on social media. This is also partially answered with my second point from last week. Emotion has to be kept in check if we are to have lucid thoughts on any topic. So, are the politics too invasive? Yes, but we have a choice. We don't have to personally go down these roads of emotional unreasonableness, and nationally there are elections coming up. The beauty of this great country is that for now, there is always a choice. So yes, the politics and emotion have clouded lucid rational thought, but we also have a choice as citizens of this great country. So the second set of questions are, what do your fellow officers think? What does command think? And is there command pressure to avoid this discussion? So on these questions, I'm very fortunate. I live and work in a county with predominantly similar beliefs to mine on this subject. I work for an agency that also has similar views, and I work in a state that has similar views. So on these matters, I'm very fortunate. That being said, law enforcement always has to be careful what they say publicly, but I've never had an issue so long as what I say is well-reasoned, rational thought, and done respectfully. So as far as some sort of command pressure to avoid the conversation, I would say... Not at all, other than the standard watch what you say in the public arena in general, which is indicative of the world that we live in. I also have not had any specific conversations with those in a command level position in reference to these topics. However, I can say that I know more people that agree with my stance than disagree among my closest associates. So at my agency, in this county and in this state, I've not personally had to deal with these disparaging issues. But, as you can see in the news, this is not true at a national level. Some of our brothers and sisters in blue are dealing with immense political pressure, both internally and externally to the organization. 
To that end, I would say that in law enforcement and other similar careers, you're always towing this line. You're walking a path betwixt these two worlds. You are a citizen with hopefully strong opinions and beliefs for the betterment of this country, and you are the image, and for many, the only image of the government with whom they actually have a lot of interaction. So you have a job to do. And what you hope at the end of the day is that your job and the governmental role that you take on are congruent. However, as the pendulum swings to one extreme or the other, this may not always be the case. So then when faced with that situation, you have a decision to make. But I believe strongly that in any line of work, at any career path, if you are deriving a paycheck from someone, then you have really the only right, which is to do what they say and support them publicly and not be disparaging. And if you cannot do that, then the only decision you have to make is whether or not you should change your job. Now, I understand that this is not an easy decision when you're talking about your livelihood and a career path that you've been in. So that is why for everyone, and not just law enforcement in a free country, elections are so, so important. We cannot be and should not be narrow-minded, single-issue voters. We have to think broader than that, and we have to think about where our elected officials at all levels going to stand on these issues and other important issues. If you believe strongly that we need men and women in government who support law enforcement, support gun rights, support the United States as it was founded as a democratic republic, then among other topics, then we need to make sure that we are making this statement at the voters box. So now for the rest of the questions. Here's my personal opinion, which I wanna stress is mine alone, and if you differ, that's fine. I hope we can have civil and respectful discourse about it sometime. But to the first question, what is your position on gun control? And then I'm going to kind of follow that up with referencing the black rifles, assault rifles, modern sporting rifles, handguns, and then is an armed citizenry a deterrence criminals. So from the top, my position on gun control is to refer to the Second Amendment of the Constitution. And I'm not saying that to be smart, but what does it say? It says that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Now, there is no way in 15 minutes that I can fully wade into the murky, dark waters of interpretation, court precedent, the argument that times have changed. I also cannot fully vet out counter arguments, such as whether or not the well-regulated militia is only is the only purpose for having the arms, which is argued by some that is no longer needed, or whether or not the second part of the sentence guarantees that the right is open to all, and as it simply says, shall not be infringed. There are many differing points of view on this that go all the way back to whether or not you fall into a Federalist or an Anti-Federalist camp, and whether or not that you believe the Constitution and its amendments are living, breathing documents that change with time. Hence, you'll hear arguments like, well, we no longer fear the military. We are protected by the military, and we no longer need militias anymore, etc., etc. So where do I stand on the issue? For me, it's simple. I don't read too much into the so-called modern interpretation of things that takes place decades, even centuries after they were written. And by contrast, I try to always look to the original intent of the authors that may, what they were thinking when they authored it at the time. I also believe in literal interpretation and the application of most timeless documents, not in some changing lens of modernity that somehow gives us more clarity than what the original writer or framers would have seen at the time. No, I do not believe history somehow becomes clearer with time, and I don't believe that documents somehow evolve and start to mean something different than they did in the late 1700s. Our founders had a few concerns, and they knew that from what they were dealing specifically with with England, that some protections needed to be codified. So let me step back from just the Second Amendment for a moment. What is the role of government? It's to protect the sovereign nation and to ensure a balance to potential anarchy. But in fulfilling these two extremely limited roles, government should also be kept so small that it fits within the Constitution of the United States. Once a behemoth begins to grow and stretch, as it has done time and time again, things begin to get out of hand. We've seen this with the scourge of progressivism that took a firm hold on the United States in the early 1900s, and it continued full speed into the seemingly uncontrollable beast that it can become. But there was a time that there was plenty of understanding that the government's role, its only two roles, were pretty simple and didn't affect the common man all that much. In fact, it was the common man that was still going to Washington and serving short terms as representatives while still having a farm or a family, vocation, or some sort of trade back home. At this time, there was no question that people had the right to protect themselves. They needed a way to hunt and to feed their families, to be called upon in case the militia was needed for protection. However, there was a shift, 
a major shift. Taxation allowed the growth of money that allowed expansion. The limiting of freedoms came along in the name of crisis. Uh, depression, World War II, these sound familiar? We have crisis and then freedom diminishes and government expands, fundamentally changing the face of America and our understanding of autonomy and freedom. And most important, our responsibility within this freedom. And a quick side note, because anymore when the term freedom is used void of context and definition, we begin picturing either hippies at Woodstock or teens running off doing whatever makes them happy. I mean, come on, that is not freedom. Freedom without responsibility is not freedom at all. It's merely bondage in another form. So the world has changed. We all know that. And this is where I usually get called an idealist. But I believe we can go back. Not easily, but ever so slightly in baby steps, in small daily decisions, in elections at all levels of government, in the taking of personal responsibility. But I do believe that it is never too late for change. That is fundamental to the way we govern. It's just not always easy. So what does all this have to do with firearms and the question at hand? Well, first of all, I'm well aware that I oversimplified this history lesson I provided, but I also encourage you to research. And like I said earlier, be very careful of the source of this research, since somehow history has changed. But do your own research and read other letters and writing by our founding fathers to better understand the intent. But no, the government should not be quote-unquote controlling guns of any type. When it comes to all these different types of weapon systems, I see them as I do all guns as tools. And as tools, they can all serve a different role for the user, and one is not more or less important for that user. We live in a time of unparalleled technological advances. And to simply say, well, that weapon wasn't around back then, so it is not included in the clearly unilateral amendment statement arms, is foolishness at best. The weapons of that time were developed for military and civilian use, and each tool has its own purpose and nothing has changed in that regard. Sometimes you need a hammer, sometimes you need a screwdriver, sometimes you need a wood plane, and you have to pick the proper tool for the proper application. And yes, you might be able to drive a nail with a screwdriver, but it's a ridiculous application when you can just go get a hammer. The other thing that bothers me is this misunderstanding of when weapons are fired in self-defense. The only reason to fire a weapon in self-defense in any application, be it military, law enforcement, or civilian protection, is to save a life. So there's a fundamental issue with the verbiage that we use. You're going to save someone's life, yours or someone else's. People will refer to these instances as taking life. But if you use a weapon properly in self-defense or for any protection, it should solely be for the purpose of saving a life. So if you're one of these that are saying, well, these weapons are evil, they're only used for taking lives. Yes, evil people do take lives with them. But sit and think on the true purpose of the weapon, and hopefully that will change your perspective as well. So let me boil this down for you a little bit further. Weapons are tools. Some are used for hunting, others for personal defense, others for long-range defense, and some for fun and pleasure. But ultimately, it is not the government's role, per the government limiting document itself, the Constitution and its amendments, to decide your right to bear arms. That part should be fairly clear. So the final portion of this question, is an armed citizenry a deterrent to criminals? Well, let me ask the question another way, given what we're talking about here. Do gun-free zones work? If so, there should be limited gun violence in Chicago. There should be no incidents at airports, no incidents at schools, and in a broader sense of violence as a whole, then mass casualty events should never take place in prison, some of the most secure locations in the world, with some of the strictest, strictest weapon laws, or weapons rules that take place. But that's not the reality. Gun-free zones, weapons-free zones do not work, and there are ample examples of when good guys with guns have stopped bad guys with guns. So is it a deterrent, as in would people not commit crimes if gun laws were broader and we eliminated gun-free zones? No, I don't think it's that simple either. However, it wouldn't hurt, and it would be a great starting point, because the only chance to stop being a bad guy with a gun is making sure we have good guys with them. So the issue here is what I titled these episodes, is looking for solutions to mass casualty events. And it has little to do with firearms specifically. The question is, how do we deal with these horrific events, and is there anything that we can actually do to prevent them? To that end, I'm going to do a third and final podcast and video that concludes what we've been talking about, and then offer some empirical data and some considerations on the findings from some of these events. But 
these episodes will not release as a typical podcast. I don't want to make this the only topic that we're dealing with on here. And there's some other positive, uplifting, helpful topics that I want to discuss in the coming weeks. So the third and final discussion on this matter is going to be released only to our closed Facebook group on the Blue Line Guild and as members only content on our Patreon page. So please be sure to join our closed Facebook group, which is absolutely free. Or if you support us on Patreon, you'll also be able to get it there. I hope I've answered the questions that were asked as honestly and informatively as I could, but I also understand that these are not easy questions, and hence there are no easy solutions. So if you have a differing opinion, please be sure to share it. I would love to hear your thoughts. I also want to encourage everyone to know why they believe what they believe. So if you've got a strong opinion on the matter, challenge it every once in a while, and be sure that you know why you hold that opinion. As John Adams said at the height of unpopularity, believing that everyone has the right to a legal defense, facts are stubborn things. And that they are. Whether or not you like them, whether or not they fit our agenda or they don't, facts, not your opinions, your feelings, or the emotional seesaw, facts alone are what matter at the end of the day. Seek truth and you'll not be disappointed. So let me leave you with two thoughts, one of which is often quoted, And first, Thomas Jefferson, speaking on the constitutional interpretation, wrote in a letter to William Johnson, On every occasion of constitutional interpretation, let us carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted. Recollect the spirit manifested in the debates. And instead of trying to force what meaning may be squeezed out of the text or invented against it, instead let us conform to the probable one in which it was passed. So this is my initial point, that the Constitution's intent at the time it was drafted should be our starting point for all such debates. And also, there's the great quote that's attributed to Benjamin Franklin. They that give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. In some ways, we are here. Always be cautious what you are willing to give up in the name of security, for the false promise of a utopian society. It's a facade. It's a mirage. It doesn't exist. And in the end, you will find yourself enslaved with no more safety than you had before. But you don't have to take my word for it. Look to socialist ideology and communism, and then follow those through processes to their historical disastrous conclusions. The facts, they're stubborn things. So with that, thank you for joining me in this conversation. It was a little outside the norm, but I hope it benefits you, gives you something to consider, and provokes insightful thought and discourse. If it does this, it has fulfilled its mission. That does it for this week's Monday Morning Roll Call. Please check out the show notes and follow the links or visit our website at onthebluelang.com where many more links and more information is available. Thanks for listening. Have a great week and I will see you next Monday at Roll Call. And in the meantime, I will see you out there on the Blue Line. 